It's lovely to be with you. I'm with you as a historian, not as a theologian, which is why I've dressed appropriately, <laughs> um, because I'm, I'm not, I, don't, I don't have no licentiate in theology, although I think deeply about it. And I've been a deacon for 26 years, so I do know something about this in the workplace. Um, and I normally give lectures that last 55 minutes on 10 years, and now I'm going to talk for 35 minutes on 2,000 years. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. And this is the title which I saddle myself with. A couple of things that guide us through that will be themes that we keep on coming back to. Oh. We need to get to the, um, back, what we did before was get to, back to the screen which gives you the, all the, let's see. we had it working before. Ah, okay, so just, sorry, just the um, bar, yeah. Um, two things will guide us through. Uh, you'll know about this. The deacon is what he is, not what he does. It's not a job description, it's a way of life. It's an ontological condition. And we'll come back to ontology in due course. John Paul II, who was a huge fan of the diaconate, uh, uh, links, uh, he talks about the seamlessness of the church between the whole body of Christ, the seamlessness. And he sees that the, the, world, uh, that the world of the deacon are standing both at the altar and in the midst of the poor and needy as being that um, ontological grace. The specific role of the altar deacon comes later. Now, this is... Um, John N. Collins is one of the people who's guiding me through this, and many of you will know about the work of John N. Collins, which has, been, which has caused quite a lot of, of ruffling in dovecuts. Uh, he, one of the phrases that is very, very used in any documents about the history of the diaconate is to quote Mark 10, 45. The Son of Man came not to serve, but to be served, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And very frequently, you only get the first half of that. And the deacons are there, not to, ser uh, not, not to serve, but to be served. And having looked etymologically at that verse, and in fact it's part of his whole pattern, he reorganizes that Greek in what he thinks is a more authentic way of translation to say the Son of Man came not to be waited on hand and foot, and then full stop, he came to serve by giving his life for the ransom of many. So the not but to serve is part of the second half of the sentence, not the first. He came to serve by giving his life for the ransom of many. Now, if we see the deacons want to take up Mark 10, 45, they have to, I think, to take seriously this reparsing of that sentence. And that is something that will be a theme that I'll be running through in what follows. Um, another thing which you all come across all the time is the... Is the paragraph on the diaconate in the Lumen Gentium. At a lower level of the hierarchy of the deacons who receive the imposition of hands not to the priesthood but to the ministry. For strengthened by sacramental grace they're dedicated to the people of God in conjunction with the bishop and his body of priests in the service of the liturgy of the gospel and of works of charity. And I've put three bits of that into italic because I'm going to argue those three bits would not have been recognised by the early church. The rest would. They would not have recognised at a lower level of the hierarchy because they didn't understand what you mean by hierarchy. It was not in conjunction with the bishop and the priest, but with the bishop. And being the bishop's man. And in some case, in the early church, actually being much in control of the priests. Only I got abolished. Anyway, we'll see about that. And at this very important point that if you, if you say, which of course is a very important part of the deacon's work, works of charity, it's to narrow unduly the range of things. 
which deacons were always called to do. It's only one of them. It is not the essential one. And that, I think, is demonstrated to me as a historian, is demonstrable. And so that will be a major part of what I, of what I want to say. In the service of the liturgy of the gospel and works of charity, I'm going to broaden that out and come up with a reformulation of that at the end. As a historian, as a theologian, I'm not criticising the Gentium. As a historian, I'm saying there are things which, which undernourish what you are, what you are recovering. If you, if you stick too closely to that. And by way of demonstration, documents which are not so familiar to us, uh, though they should be, of course, are the questions which were asked at our ordination um, and the, um, and the uh, words that are said over us um, by the bishop at our ordination. The questions are, are you willing to be ordained by laying on of hands and the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Are you resolved to discharge the office of deacon with humility and love? Are you resolved to hold the mystery of faith with a clear conscience and proclaim this faith in word and action as is taught by the gospel and the church tradition? Are you resolved to maintain and deepen a spirit of prayer? Are you resolved to shape your way of life according to the example of Christ, whose body and blood you will give the people? These aren't questions about are you going to be a man of charity? Are you going to be a new kind of person? Are you going to become a different kind of person assisted by the grace of the Holy Spirit? And, and that even includes, will you promise respect and obedience to me and my successors? Um, it is, of course, the most important, actually, not, not mockingly, seriously. Um, The prayer of consecration sets forth the sevenfold graces to carry out um, our faith, our ministry faithfully. And it talks about love that is sincere, concern for the sick and the poor, unassuming authority, self-discipline, holiness of life, and that we will lead people to imitate or cause people to imitate our purity of life. Now again, you see, concern for the sick and the poor is there but it's not the only thing. It's about being a different kind of person. If you go back to what, what the words were said over to you, think about the balance of all, all those things. Um, most important, perhaps, of all, and I'm sure you'll all remember this, and you might, like me, you know, pray it all the time, Receive the gospel of Christ, whose herald you now are. Believe what you read, teach what you believe, and practice what you teach. Now, practicing what you teach will include reaching out to all in need, but it's not confined to that. That's the, that's the essential point that I want to get across. You are her- We are heralds of the gospel of Christ. We have a fourfold foundation, a fourfold formation, and all four of those are engaged pastorally, spiritually, as well as practically, pastorally. So our mind and our hearts have to be in sync. And that is perhaps the most important. Um, the two things I remember from my ordination, I bet this is true of a lot of you, um, was lying face down while I wished I hadn't chosen quite so many saints. <laughs> there was a wonderful moment at Northern Nation recently where um, after, the, after the, uh, uh, the, the, we'd sung all the saints, um, <laughs> my parish priest uh, um, turned to me and said, by their saints you shall know them. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very specific point being made. You can guess what it is. Right, let's go back now and look. Having That's by way of preparation. Now let's go back and look. And the themes I want to develop are the instability of the early centuries. The fact that it's not just growing but changing, but changing around a core, which is what I want to identify, so we don't need to imitate what happened in the first four centuries. We have to work, imitate those that core of activity, which can be applied in our circumstances. Put ourselves back 
into the, the, the New Testament age where there are no church buildings, no settled scriptures. Of course, for the early parts, for most of Paul's letters, there are no scriptures at all. There may, there may be this mysterious Q document, which some may or may not know, but there certainly aren't. Um, so nobody, nobody has more than one gospel for a long time. There's no pope. Now, this is a historian, of course, I can say. The theologian has to be more careful. There is no pope at the end of the second century. That retrospectively, linked. there were lots of bishops in Rome. There's a bishop for each of the communities in Rome. It, there are particular circumstances in which someone becomes the lead bishop in Rome and then the lead bishop for around the, the country. There are many ministries. I mean, in that first century... Um, you've got prophets, exorcists, preachers, genealogists. You've got itinerant preachers. And you've got to remember that most of the church, most of the communities are operating in and around synagogues and imitating synagogue worship. And in synagogue worship, there is a president whose job it is to find an itinerant preacher all the time to come in and lead. Why do you think Jesus is going round? All the presidents of the synagogue saying, you really ought to hear this, this rather wild guy. He's got some really interesting things to say. So there's no settled pattern of preaching or ministry. Now in that context, how many of those servants, how many of the people who are called servants, some of them are called diaconoi, are called deacons, how many of them have a job for life? how many of them are commissioned to do specific things for a specific time, like we have with Eucharistic ministers or readers. You're not supposed to be there for the whole of your life. You're supposed to rotate. That's what seems to have happened, and I'm pretty sure that's what happened with the so-called diaconoi. They're chosen by the bishops, who are the successors of the apostles, to do specific jobs for specific periods of time. The idea that you have a, that you are now being transformed for life is really not happening instantly with the creation of the church um, as Jesus dies on the cross. Deacons for specific times, places, mainly on the move. And if we look at the book of Acts and you look at Paul's epistles, and if I had at my hour, not my 35 minutes, I'll give you lots of examples of how Paul himself describes himself of going on ministry. He talks about sending Timothy and Titus. He sends whole families on particular ministries, particular jobs, which are called diaconal jobs, but doesn't mean they're deacons, and they're not called deacons. We'll come back to Stephen a bit later. We'll keep him as a special case, or Stephen and his companions. And we'll come back to Phoebe later as well, uh, which is going to put the cat amongst the pigeons. Um, in Titus, Paul said to Pi Titus, he says, now there was a variety of diaconia ministries, is how it's translated in, in, in our, our there's a variety of di diaconias, but the same Lord. And, he, and commissioning is not the same thing as ordaining. We mustn't think that because hands are laid on people that they're being ordained, they're being commissioned. When they become ordained, that is understood as being the, the Holy Spirit entering an indelible mark being implanted. That's not something we can actually guarantee to have happened in the first century. If we move on in this whistle stop to the next 200 years, down to 300 we have very few church buildings. We have no stable scriptures. There's no agreement on what the scriptures should be. They're varying from place to place. Uh, there's no liturgical texts. Uh, what we know before 200 is that there is a kind of, there's a kind of framework for liturgy. But then within that, the choice of readings, the Eucharistic prayer is, is, is down to the inspiration of the individual president or, or episcopus or bishop or presbyter. And there are five patriarchies, and this is very important. The patriarchies, um, more or less by seniority, um, of uh, uh, Jerusalem, Antioch, 
Alexandria, Constantinople and Rome. There is absolutely no way that anyone, including the Bishop of Rome, can tell any other patriarch what to do. The patriarchs want to hear from one another what they're doing and how they can resolve difficulties. They listen to one another, but in the end, there is no authority for the whole church. Now, because of the way in which, by common consent, the bringing of the bones of Peter and Paul from the catacombs and the, and the Bishop of Rome sitting on top of them gives him a special authority, there is a special respect for the Bishop of Rome. And, and they want to get advice from the Bishop of Rome. They hope the Bishop of Rome will solve their problems for them of disputes. But they're not bound to, and they frequently don't, particularly when bishops of Rome are heretics, which they are in the 4th century, by, by any standard. So there's much discussion in the literature from about 90 to, to 200 about the role of deacons. A turning point is 1 Timothy, um, which of course is not by Paul, but is by people in the tradition of Paul and written between 90 and 100, um, in which um, in which the, uh, the charisms of the deacon are laid out. Um, there are important things in the letters of Ignatius of Antioch, who was thrown to the lions just after writing these letters, in which he talks about the deacons as having, uh, uh, being the servants um, of the Church of God. Uh, but it's not, the word isn't diaca, uh, diaconia, it is hyperitai. Um, and it means the stewardship, the stewardship of the Church of God. There are important testimonies by Justin Martyr around 140, which I think are really powerful, about the role of deacon in worship. And then by the end of the early into the second century, you get a, a very important contribution by Hippolytus, who is um, in Rome, who writes what is now Eucharistic Prayer 2, the earliest of the Eucharistic prayers that we have. Two, four, one, three is the sequence. But two is the second you prefer is, an, is a fairly likely adapted version of Politus. Now he has, has a very clear sense, as we'll see a bit later, I've got time. I'm going to come back to some of these things in more detail if I have time, in which we look at what Hippolytus has to tell us. So by the second and third centuries, deacons are clustered, there are no parishes, there are no churches. There are, there are bishops who now have a number of presbyters who are there sending out to households to conduct worship. And they have, they're also clustered around the bishop are the deacons who are carrying out the administrative jobs. They're chief of staff, chief operating officers for the bishops. Um, uh, but they're also at the heart of the worship and because I may run out of time, I will say this now. It, when we look at, when we, when, if you look at the history of the texts of the Mass, you can see there are some things which are residual, which are really telling you something quite important about deacons. And one is receiving the gifts and preparing the altar. Back in the second and third century, lots of food would be brought up. Some of it would be taken to the altar to be consecrated. The rest would be taken to side tables to be blessed. And that blast bread and cuts that we taken out to the poor and needy. And it's the deacons who do that. And the deacons are around the bishop preparing the altar because the bishop, because the, the deacons are there like the Levites in the old temple worship to do the manual work while the priests concentrate on, on the prayer. And in every, if you look at the liturgy now, what do deacons do? The deacons address the people and the priest addresses God. We should have one more line. We haven't noticed we've got few enough. We should be the one who announced the acclamation at the height of the... And, of course, in the early church, we did. So along with exchanging the peace, with the dismissal, there should be that. And, of course, with the, of course I'm perfectly happy to give this up. They should be doing the, the general intercessions. Introduced and closed by the priest. So when the people are being approached, it's the deacon when God's being, that's the, that's the root of it. And it's much clearer in the early church where you get this. So in fact, 
because the, the, the uh, bishop is surrounded by deacons and there's no concelebration, other priests are not concelebrating, they are then given Holy Communion by the deacons. That's stopped in a explicit act of the Council of Nicaea. But until the Council of Nicaea, the deacons are the ones who are distributing. If you're not, a, if you're not the celebrant, then you are part of the people. Okay, a bit behind, but not, not disastrously. The big turn out in so many things is with Constantine. Once the church becomes official, once indeed it becomes the official religion of the empire, then everything takes off. Churches which have been gradually building, especially buildings, then become you know, everywhere, state-supported. You've got, st- you've got an agreement on the content of the scripture, you've got to stabilise scriptures, you've got patterns of jurisdiction, and you've got the great bifurcation. Instead of having lots of powerful deacons around every bishop, Cap being his man of business, going out carrying messages, going out resolving disputes and coming back, you now get two kinds of deacons, ones which are settled in parishes with very much diminished responsibilities, answerable to the bishop but not necessarily in regular touch with him. And you've got really important deacons still around, around the bishops. So much so um, that you now have um, uh, you now have popes who are normally deacons until the moment they're, they're made pope. Between, between oh, I've got the dates wrong on the, on the old slide, it must have been something like 325 to 640. It's about a 300 year period. Almost all the popes were deacons until they became popes. Many bishops, too, are deacons until, until they become bishops or even patriarchs. I mean, Athanasius, who's a deacon at the Council of Nicaea, goes back to Alexandria, the bishop dies and becomes the next bishop. Um, there are many, many deacons who are, they're disproportionately martyred. I mean, the proportion of deacons who are martyred is much higher than the proportion of priests because, because they are see when you do get big persecutions, the, uh, the authorities go after the deacons who are the crucial links between the bishops and the, and, the, and the communities around. So Lawrence is famous, of course, and Lawrence is a great, is a great hero to us. But Lawrence happened to be out on mission when uh, the, uh, the Bishop of Rome and the other deacons were killed. And when he came back, uh, that he, of course, famously pointed to the poor as the treasure of the church and suffered a particularly excruciating death. But he was dying along with his bishop and was expected to die along with his bishop to give his life. If his bishop was giving his life, then the deacon was expected to. Um, as I say, you know, we don't need to do everything today that we did. <laughs> <laughs> and the, with, the, with, the, with the fact that the temple's gone, uh, the Jewish diaspora, the church has separated away, it's now possible, I think, for the church to th- use Old Testament models much more creatively. It wasn't as complicated as it had been. And that's when the language of the presbyters becoming priests in the Jewish sense, offering sacrifice, and the deacons become the Levites who assist the priests at the mysteries. And that definitely consolidates the role of the deacon uh, within the liturgical world. And I've already dealt with the, the question of the oratory, or offertory a bit sooner than I forgot. Right, let's move on. Because I'm... And then there comes the atrophy. I used to think that deacons were suppressed um, because they got to... But there was a lot of literature uh, of complaints about bishops being, uh, deacons being bossy and, uh, and being in control. And there, there were certainly... And, uh, for example, um, just give one example, Jerome complained that the bishop would only ordain as priests the people recommended to him by the deacons. Um, so uh, that, ha- that was, that was a, so there was that, there is that side of it, but I think it actually has a rather strange, um, or it has another side, it has a, a, a thing. I think what happened, and, and also say the rise of monasteries, with the rise of monasteries, many of the charitable works that have been associated with deacons passed to monasteries and indeed to civil authority. 
But I think you know that once the, once the, the change that I've just outlined took place, it's not that, that priests wouldn't allow deacons to be deacons, it's that deacons decided they might as well become a priest. And that's where the trans- then move from a bit of the creation of transitional comes in. Because deacons think, well, actually we're not doing much as deacons, we'd be better off being priests. And the case for it became very atrophied. Um, I'll have to leave it there to push on. But just to just remind you, of course, there, are always, there always are people who prefer to be permanent deacons. Alcuin, the great, uh, great uh, uh, monkish um, advisor to Charlemagne, uh, St. Francis is always a deacon and never a priest. Um, Pius III was the last of the popes. This is 1503. He only was pope for 26 days. Um, he, was, he, he was the last person who was a deacon until the day before his uh, papal, papal um, uh, coronation. Reginald Pole, who became Queen Mary's card, uh, Arch, Cardinal Archbishop of, West, of um, uh, Canterbury, uh, uh, Reginald Pole was, um, was a deacon when he presided at the Council of Trent in 1546-1547, and he was Cardinal uh, Deacon until the day before he became Archbishop of Canterbury. So this still this continues. Cardinal Consalvi was a cardinal as a deacon when he negotiated with Napoleon the restoration of uh, France to, to uh, look to the, the, the to, to Catholic faith, and Cardinal Antonelli, who was the past the tenth Secretary of State, was a was a deacon um, throughout his life. So this never goes away entirely, but then it just survived into the, in remaining in the consciousness for what we're going to hear about later, which is the restoration. I'm not going to talk, I haven't got time to talk about the, I'll talk about it in questions if you like, talk about what happened in the 1960s. Instead of that, I just want to, have I got time? How long have I got? Not very long. Have I got another six, seven minutes? Oh, well, okay, I want to, okay, question, okay, I'll try and get some questions. So I've done Mark, so I've done Mark. Uh, Just a couple of things I want to talk about, I must talk about women deacons. Um, Philippians. From Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all God's holy people in Philippi, together with their presiding elders, episcopoi, and deacons. There's only one, there's only one church community in Philippi. It's got six episcopoi. This is not a church in which you've got this, 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 this structure established. I commend to you my sister Phoebe, deacon, some translation say deaconess of the church of Centuria. That's part of Corinth. She is an extremely wealthy um, and uh, patroness, not least of Paul. We don't know who else she's patroness of, not necessarily of the poor, probably, but not necessarily of the poor. She's clear that she has been sent on a mission to Rome, and she's leading up a mission. There is no evidence that she had hands laid on her, and there's no evidence that she was a permanent thing. It was a mission that she was doing. So you can't build a case for women deacons on Phoebe. And that's very bad news for me. I really don't think it's a story. It's a tremendous... But it doesn't mean to say that that question is closed. So, what do I say about that? I'll have to miss out the... the I'll have to miss out the, uh, the others, except to say that Justin Martyr tells us that the deacons are responsible for the distribution of communion at the Eucharist and taking it to all those in need. All those in need. But we'll have to just just skip the rest of that and move on to the very end. Right. As you probably know, the Holy Father set up a commission um, and it it couldn't agree. Were there women, were there ordained women deacons in the early church? He chose people who had clear views and they sat in trenches and threw mud at one another. It was not the Jesuit genuine deep sharing. So he set up a second commission of less expert people to ask them to be listened to one another more carefully. I think there is some comfort for though, the supporters of um, women's ordination in 1 Timothy where um, and after giving the charisms of the of male deacons, it appears, that I can't see why the Greek could mean anything else, that there are charisms of women who are also deacons. So I think there are women, and at that stage we see in, in, in Timothy that this is becoming a, a, a long-term job, if you like, an ontological change, not... 
The big issue, as I've understood it from talking to people who know about this much more than I do, is this, that you can find evidence of women being ordained uh, as late as the 4th century. There's definitely a decline after 100 because, of course, at that stage the women, the women were being told they couldn't speak in, in public, which, of course, was an essential part of any deacon's role. But there is evidence of, of ordination, but this is the crucial point, which is why I made this earlier on. The evidence is all from Alexandria and Antioch, not from Rome. So even if it's found that the evidence is sufficient to say there are ordained women in the church in the 3rd and 4th centuries, you wouldn't find it ever, ever, as it were, accepted by authority in Rome, though we can't find Rome of denouncing it. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm prepared absolutely to, to trust to the wisdom of the, those the Pope has, has entrusted this to, and I, and I will I will be happy either way, frankly. Um, uh, I will be happy either way. I don't have, I don't have a strong commitment either way. Uh, but I think it is a complicated issue. Right, just a final slide. What do we learn about from this about us today? Bishops are, uh, deacons never exist in relationship to, to, in the first 500 years, deacons never exist except in relationship to a bishop. We do not have minds of our own. We have minds which are guided. We are, we are people who do what is needed doing and we take guidance from those whose charisms are to guide. We are needed whenever, what is needed is whatever the times need. If I'd had more time, I'd have shown you the different types of activity that deacons do in the early centuries. That's still the case. We do what our times need, which doesn't mean looking back to see what they did in the third or fourth century. Look back and say what the deacons were for was to, to nourish the church. However, the bishops felt it needed to be nourished. That they are never to be seen as bridges, as builders of community. If something carries on from then to now, it is, are we builders of communities? I don't, I don't think there's any evidence we can see ourselves as bridges. We can see ourselves as builders of communities. Um, we are engaged in the, in the offertory, in the holy exchange from the people of God, in what happens in the Eucharist? We, we take bread, wine, and our superfluity that we put in the basket. We say, we have done everything we can with what you've given us, Lord. We have done amazing things in converting grain and grape into bread and wine, but you can do something much more wonderful. And you can do it to the bread and wine, and you can do it to us through our encounter and we are at the heart of facilitating that in guiding the people through it. The deacon has always linked word, altar, and witness. Ita missa est. The worst translation in the whole of ISIL. It cannot mean go, the mass is ended. Nothing has ended. The, the Latin must mean go, it is sent the good news, or she is sent, the gospel. And we say it because we are leading, as deacons, we're leading people out. Because the body of Christ is risen and glorified in heaven, the body of Christ is present for us on the altar, and through our encounter with the body of Christ, we become the body of Christ for others. And we are central to that process of, ch of channeling. And that's why... There's no amen at the end of the Mass, as Timothy Radcliffe says, but a leading, sending and leading forth. The deacon isn't what he is, not what he, uh, he is, sorry, the deacon is what he is, not what he does. Because there is this intimate connection between us around the altar and then what we are called to do in the community, whether that's to, uh, to be prison chaplains, whether it's to be chairman of commissions because the priests are too busy, whether it's to be lead, lead pilgrimages to Lourdes, whatever it is in the modern age. It's all focused on sacred visibility. Sacred visibility 
and sacred availability with the grace of orders by becoming a new reality to ordination as with all the sacraments the sacrament of orders transforms that which encounters God in the, in the sacrament itself if we believe in that for baptism if we believe in it for marriage if we believe in it for the Eucharist then we believe in it for our ordination and one last line one of my friends was ordained as a deacon he was a school teacher and he heard, or one of his colleagues reported he heard two little boys in the corridor saying I think Mr M has become a beacon <laughs> and I cannot think of a better one line than that have we become deacons or have we become beacons thank you Thank you, John, for that fascinating whistle-stop tour through the history, and certainly I learned a lot. I'm sure each of you did. Just to be clear about the process that we're using, there is um, a discussion period tomorrow after all three of the plenary uh, um, inputs uh, which you'll be able to unpack and hopefully formulate some questions, and then there's a plenary session on the Sunday morning where those sharp questions can be put to our panellists. So I'd suggest in the few minutes we have here, rather than start those debates, if there is anything that anybody would like John just to clarify, anything that was, was not clear or you didn't quite get what he was saying, uh, that's how we'll use these few minutes now. But the debates that will certainly um, take place can take place uh, tomorrow and Sunday morning. So any questions for clarification? Paul Daly, we have, we have a, a handheld mic on its way to you. Is that something that was going through my mind as I was driving here? Um, when you mentioned that 34 and 37 popes were deacons when they were elected Bishop of Rome, were they then, is there any evidence as to whether they were or weren't subsequently ordained precedents? Right. Uh, and the answer is, that with time, it becomes more common for them to be uh, may, may entered into presbyterate. But there are plenty of examples, particularly first half, where they go straight from deacon to bishop without being made presbyters, because it's assumed that the completeness of, uh, after all, that the priest is in fact uh, someone who is, as who a deputy bishop. So, in a sense, the, the notion of orders was. But uh, with time, it, it has become, it has be, the, the, sort of the three stages have become more and more marked. But, I mean, I think, I think uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain Athanasius, for example, was never made, made, never made a priest. Um, um, and there are, uh, the, uh, in one of the kind of more esoteric books I read, there was actually a paragraph about it, which I'm afraid I didn't make notes on. Thank you, but I can report, that's what, that was the gist of it, yeah. David... And uh, Mark, sorry, and then, sorry, I don't know you. Thank you, John. Yeah, it's working. Uh, a related question. Uh, just in the same way were many priests in the early patristic age, particularly, not ordained deacons before they were ordained. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And what happened, what happened, I mean, again, it was a slide, one of the slides which went, got, got cut, um, um, yesterday when I was cutting. Um, there, there is a lo that long period during which the bishop is surrounded by his priests, and this is, I'm talking now about the second and third centuries, is surrounded by his priests because they're going to be going out basically uh, on mission. Um, and that they, when they're discussing the strategies of who should go where and so on and whether there are issues in particular um, communities that need to be addressed, uh, the deacons are excluded from those discussions. But at other times, the dish, the, the, what it looks to me as though the model which is working is, is what we might say is the county council um, uh, model, where you've got elected representatives who are sent to the priests, and then you've got the officers of the council advising 
who are the deacons, which is why the deacons come to be the ones who tell the tell the bishop, if you want to have a, a priest, you can send the library out, send them out the library into that area, I, I would choose so and so. Um, so they are, as it were, the advisors, but, the, but there is a kind of different kind of bond between the, the bishop and the, and the priest. And there's never, um, there's never any sense in which bishops... Um, uh, no, I'll leave it to that. I'll leave it to that. Thank you. Jihad had a question here and then somebody at the back there. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jihad from Southern Kent. Would it be more appropriate if you say the deacon is who he is, not what he y- is? Yeah, probably. Probably. It was, I was quoting somebody else. I, I wasn't making it up. I was quoting somebody else, but I, I, I take your point. I think it's... I, the reason for saying what is that it is a consequence of an encounter with the Holy Spirit. So, he, so who he is... Who he, he, there is a who he is before he's ordained, which is the same as who he is at one level afterwards, but in another level not. What he, what is, uh, uh, actually, you could say, perhaps, that if we find it, a deacon is what he becomes, rather than is becomes might be a better might be a better word for it. Thank you, but thank you for that clarification. Well, thank you for uh, the word. Um, if I heard correctly, what you're saying Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the, the church as such changed maybe from a service based church to more of a liturgical, sacramental based church. Yeah. So I'm not sure if I'm putting words in your mouth. But I, think that, I think the argument is that the. Um, uh, well, the, 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 the deacon in the second, third, fourth century is very much being sent out to do whatever needs doing. That will include works of charity. But it certainly includes resolving disputes. It certainly means um, catechetics. It certainly means training, uh, giving such training as priests get, as well as what deacons get. So the, the deacons are chosen because they are, they are well edu- highly educated already and have the knowledge which is then, of course, developed by practice and then they are looking and helping to to through apprenticeship to get the priest ready for the work in the field now within that context um, as you move towards a large number of settled communities without having the same regular clergy the sending out of deacons to every one of those communities becomes um, uh, less common because because of the importance. Oh, and I never did talk. I never did talk about Stephen. Um, that was one thing I thought I mustn't leave out. But because of the importance of the seven, it becomes established every bishop should have a, should have seven deacons. Um, and those seven deacons, as the as the areas grow and the number of communities grow, have to be spread more thinly, in which case their prime, any kind of primary responsibility for welfare is bound to be you know, re, 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 transferred to others. But when the big push to create parishes goes on, and monastic communities are very important and pregnant, they're increasingly important. So when the deacon really begins to disappear, it's with a huge planting of parishes um, in the, in the sort of high Middle Ages. And at that point, monasticism has very little to, uh, to have a little um, role for deacons. But I think, in other words, there are also functional reasons why the deacons are going to be less and less seen as necessary for th- that work. Any more than in many parishes, I mean, a deacon who insists that he is the minister of charity in the parish can easily get in the way of an, all kinds of abnormal things which go on in parishes. You've got a really healthy SVP, you've got a really healthy food bank, you know, if, the, if you've got a decent, you know, relationship with the social services and so on, then the need for a deacon to be the, the leading by adding to what's already there, rather than, as I do, you know, attending with, you know, doing packaging and what have you, you know, that becomes um, 
uh, it's, 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 what all I'm arguing, I'm not arguing against the, the deacon as involved in charity. I'm simply saying if you narrow it down, it, you miss all the other things. So there's a, I've heard a lot of deacons over time say, well, of course, I wasn't ordained for this, but I'm spending all my time on diocesan jobs. But actually doing diocesan jobs is as important as doing parish work. It's whatever needs doing. And, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the fact that in my diocese where we had so many Second World War Air Force bases, so they're all now prisoners because you don't need planning consent to build a prison on our on Ministry of Defence land. But, you know, the deacons are uh, now in, in, in the prisons because you, there aren't enough priests to be full-time prison chaplains. So deacons are doing that. That's a classic example of a deacon taking on that which needs doing and which nobody else can, can easily do, and certainly nobody else with the grace of orders can do. I think we could just do that, but I think our society is seeking a church and service. Yeah, but that service, I mean, it might, might, for what it's worth, I think the service of people who are spiritually poor people on the margins, our work with, so I mean I do think our work as, as the deacons and family men and so on, in working with people on the margins and helping them back into a relationship with church at, to the rites of passage is something where there are all kinds of ways in which deacons can make a very distinctive contribution. Yeah. Thank you. We're, we're five minutes over the time for our um, uh, AGM to start. So once again, just want to thank uh, John for that masterful uh, presentation of so much in such a short time. Thank you, John.